Good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming to the Spring Winter Wheat Webinar. I'm Carly Reimer with Ducks Unlimited Canada and the Western Winter Wheat Initiative, and we've got uh, hopefully just under an hour for you of pretty exciting presentations. We're so glad you could join us. Uh, we're actually going to be recording this webinar, and it will be available on our YouTube channel uh, later today after it is done. If you have any questions, you guys are going to be all on mute, so no worries. You can actually ask questions through the question window. I'll be keeping track of them throughout the webinar, and then we can answer them at the end of it. And as always, you can reach out to us at growwinterwheat.ca and, and find one of the agronomists that are speaking today uh, so you can follow up with any questions you have, or you can connect with us on Twitter at Grow Winter Wheat, and we can definitely have a conversation on there. So there's lots of ways you can get a hold of us. Uh, we hope that you find this webinar interesting and actually learn something. And uh, thank you for supporting uh, Winter Wheat and wanting to learn more about it. So we're just going to get right into it. Uh, our first presenter is Janine Paley. She is our Winter Wheat agronomist in Northern Alberta, or for all of Alberta for that reason. And she's going to be speaking a little more on spring assessment and how to conduct a proper spring assessment and kind of what it's looking like going into the spring right now. So I'm handing over the controls to Janine and she's going to kick us off. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I have the pleasure today of talking about spring assessment, and this is probably the hottest topic on everyone's mind if you are have grown winter wheat or if you're an industry person that has clients that are grown, have grown winter wheat. And so today, hopefully, I can give you some direction on whether or not um, how to assess it and whether or not that crop uh, survives the winter. So moving forward. Overview of what we will see today on my presentation. Um, the parameters that affect winter survivability. Uh, we'll, I'll touch base on how to conduct a proper spring assessment. And then finally, um, once you've done a, a proper spring assessment, making that final decision whether to, to keep the crop or to terminate that field. So to, to really understand winter survivability, we need to take a step back and understand what are the parameters that affect winter survivability. A survival is not just one underlying factor, but a, a compound of items. So we need to understand what was that plant stage going in the fall? How much snow cover did we achieve throughout the winter? When did it, when did it arrive for most parts? Um, then we have to look at variety selection. What kind of variety does that grower have? And then as well as um, maybe potentially looking at seed treatment, does that have any, will that have any effect on survivability as well? Well, for the most part of the prairies, you guys experience something like this. It was dry conditions. Growers were looking at the field going, should I seed, should I not seed winter wheat? Um, and, but however, where I live and in parts of Saskatchewan, and Northern Alberta, this is what we experienced. Uh, we've gone through two years of a wet cycle and it looks like, once again, we, we will be wet again this spring. So I guess that, the, the moisture conditions will, play, will, be, will be playing a huge role in terms of, of survivability. Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll talk about that. All right, my computer does not want to advance here. There we go. When evaluating a, the a crop in the springtime, we need to, about, to con really consider what was that plant going into the fall time. Ideally, you want to three, see the, the field into the three-leaf stage. At a three-leaf plant stage, that plant in the fall time should have had enough, or should have had enough time in the fall to um, build up with carbohydrates and then hopefully that those carbohydrates will get have enough reserve to get through the winter. So those factors we have to consider is when did that grower seed in terms of seeding dates and another factor you should consider is seeding depth, whether or not he went deep, shallow or whether or not he went to three, three inches deep to try and uh, look for moisture. 
Uh, what I what I do want to I guess touch on is that a, a crop that is less than ideal plant stage. So if you're less than three leaf stage, so one or two like one or a two leaf stage, um, that will have a higher risk of winter damage. Therefore, you know the health and the vigor of the crop going into the winter will be the first me measurement of its ability to withstand later stress. Looking at the development of the winter hardiness. If you've seen this presentation before, you've you've seen this slide I've given numerous times. Um, the winter wheat goes through a process called cold accumulation, or uh, another term is uh, harding off in the fall time. This process, the, or the plant requires about eight to 12 weeks, depending on the variety, of growth in the fall for the develop uh, for development of full winter hardiness that takes place. So as soon so as we follow the curve, let me see if my actual, there we go, my mouse will work. Um, this is the development of hardiness. And as you can see, the hardiness will, of the plants will peak um, in November, December. And then as the, the carbohydrate reserves decrease and as, as spring comes, so does the, the winter hardiness of that plant as well. Um, this is based on North Star, which is considered one of the hard, the hardiness variety out there. But as you can see, um, this will, this bell curve will work for each and each um, variety on the market currently. The question that we get a lot is around December, January. There's not much snow cover, and we it's we have we hit extreme temperatures in terms of ambient temperatures at that minus 35 or 40 degree mark, depending on where you were this past winter. The good news is, is that at when we hit those extreme temperatures um, in terms of lowness, that is when the winter, uh, the hardiness of the plant is at its peak moment. Um, so that, that, is, that is a good thing. And I'll go into a little bit in terms of um, we have a winter survival survivability model, and I'll touch base a little bit more on hardiness and, and those factors as well. So another consideration when you're looking at survivability is what it was the variety that we seeded. Um, this is a general rating across Western Canada. So as you can see, Radiant Futail, Wildfire, Gold Rush, and Pintail are, are rated as very good in terms of survivability. Um, and then we have Elevate, Moats, Emerson are considered good, and then if Flourish and Gateway are considered um, fair in terms of survivability. So when you're evaluating the crop again, you need to consider what was, what variety did you, did you see? In terms of winter survivability, so let me just see if my mouse here, here we go. So in the ideal situation, um, we would like to see that plant in the three leaf stage and then tillering and as well as some tillering. We're not gonna look, I don't wanna focus on date in terms of uh, germination, but what I wanna consider are the factors here. So in Northern Saskatchewan, even in Northern Alberta, um, or central to Northern, Northern Alberta, the majority of the fields that we saw are in the three leaf, even I've seen fields in the five leaf stage. So they're well, develop and in those cases they have will have a high competitive factor against any kind of weed. Um, the survival index will be will be at the peak and as well as the days of maturity should be right on par to whatever that variety is. Then we then if you were seeded if you planted in an area that a little less than ideal moisture conditions, you may have experienced it. Where you have a one one to two leaf stage, what will happen is your competitiveness of that factor would decrease. So you you may be competitive against weeds, but you may not. You may have to consider um, a wild oak herbicide. Um, but what will drop is your winter survivability rating will drop, and as well as your days to maturity may potentially increase as well. Then we move into the factor of did that plant or that seed might have sprouted, but yet it didn't push or didn't create any weeds. And at that point, again, this is where the competitive factor will decrease, but your survivability will decrease quite a bit as well. 
And then we move into the factor uh, or a situation where maybe um, in extreme dry conditions that that seed seed into dust and that's where it's at. It, it didn't sprout. Um, again, a factor is that will be probably more or less on the competitive side, stays to maturity. This this plants or this field may act more like a spring wheat crop where um, less competitive it would mature similar to where your your spring wheat is. Um, however, your your survival index rating should be a little higher than than, a, than something that has sprouted. And the reason for this is because the sprouted uh, field or the sprouted seeds already had given um, used some energy and it didn't, it wasn't able to produce any leaves. So by using some energy versus non-germinated, that's where the reason why we have a, a, a decrease in survivability potentially there. Um, so moving on to the winter survivability model, um, if after the presentation, if you guys would like to play with this model a little bit more, you uh, here's the website. But for my reasons, I'm going to see if I can get this to work here. Here is uh, the model. So this is developed at the University of Saskatchewan and the Western Egg Solutions or Western Egg Professional Agronomy are taking care of, these, uh, of this model currently. There are currently in, in, the, in the ground right now, there are four probes at Seeded or placed at about the one inch one inch depth, and this will represent where initially that that crown level is of the winter cereal. There's a probe in, in out of uh, the U of S, and then there's a probe in in Lethbridge. So the beauty of this model is that you can select a probe for your area, um, and then you can also select a variety of which wheat that you're growing. For so for um, Saskatchewan, the most grown variety is Buteo, and we'll just we'll just select Buteo. You can update the graph. Here is your graph. So as the blue line will indicate what that soil temperature is at here is saying uh, three centimeters, so the one inch depth. So around that this area, as you can see, the soil temperature um, decreases as, as the winter months progress. And this black line is a cold tolerance for that particular variety. What we don't want to see is when these two lines meet, um, there is potential for winter kill to have taken place. Um, as you can see in, in Saskatchewan, these two lines do not meet, so that the model is predicting that there there was no potential damage done in throughout the winter currently. As you can see, however, the model is hasn't or the probes haven't updated um, until the beginning of our end of March or beginning of March. Sorry. What you can also play with, we will we'll look in Manitoba at this particular site. Um, detail is not growing there, but we will select we will select gateway. Um, so just keep in mind, detail again was rated as very good in terms of winter survivability. Uh, gatewaying is one of the varieties that's starting to make way or growing in Manitoba as well. Or let's go with sorry, we'll go Emerson for sure. Um, as you can see the Emerson update the graph for sure. Um, the model predicts that even though soil temperatures did decrease at around the end of February, beginning of March, um, this line, the black line of the variety of uh, the cold tolerance, they did not meet. So that's a that's a positive. However, again, if you want to look at gateway. This is where the model predicts that because Gateway was is um, is a fair in terms of rating um, survivability that there is it is predicting that there is potential of winter kill to have taken place at the end of December or end of 
end of February, beginning of March. Um, but what I want to, I do want to stress is this, or stress is this is a model, and um, there are other factors that it does not take into consideration. But this, this is a great tool if you want to play along, play around with it. What you can also look is in terms of management. So you can select um, different seeding dates. So if you seeded earlier versus seeded later, based on the for, uh, the recommendation on, for your area, um, you can also select whether or not you are at the one inch depth in terms of seeding depth, or if you decided that you're shooting for moisture and looking at a two two inches or deeper. So you can you can play with this model, and it can also um, yeah. Anyway, moving on. Oh, what I do want to, sorry, what I do want to uh, comment is if you are in, the, if you're not in the area uh, where there isn't a pro place like the Southern Saskatchewan, you may want to use um, what Manitoba is looking at. Um, but then in, in Westbridge, as you can see, uh, on within this, um, model is that it's not really predicting uh, winter winter damage to have, to have occurred. Lastly, I just want to touch on uh, seed treatment. So Brian, Dr. Brian Barris has done quite a bit of research out of uh, out of Lethbridge, but across Western Canada on, on seed treatments. And if you've seen any of our presentations, you know that we, this is something that, through his work, that we are um, trying to encourage growers or even industry um, to use as a management practices for growers in, um, that are growing winter wheat. It may not, through his work, it, um, it's, it's showing that in less than ideal conditions, so whether you're seeding later, you're seeding to dry conditions, this is where a seed treatment may have may be beneficial, more beneficial than in a normal situation. This is a project that was done at Indian Head. Um, in 2012, it was seeded literally into dust. Um, talking with Chris at, at the station, he said that it was nothing emerged. Like there was not one, not one plant emerged in the fall time. This project was looking at a seed treatment, so they used Braxel MD Pro at the time. It was evaluating um, a treated versus untreated versus a high seeding rate versus low seeding rate. As you can see on the left hand side of the untreated, um, at a higher seeding rate um, was beneficial more for more plant stands potentially um, than the lower, lower seeding rate of untreated. And sorry, this this uh, this site did not emerge until about mid May. Um, as you can see, with the treated, um, so treated with uh, seed treatments, you can see on the on the left hand side, there's a low seeding rate versus a high seeding rate. Um, so the visual, and then again, this is what the what the treated site looked like with the high seeding rate. And then we have untreated versus treated at a, at a higher seeding rate. And then lastly, this is what, this, what one of the plots look like in terms of untreated with a low seeding rate. Um, I'm not going to go into much detail in terms of what the, the outcome of this, of this or the management and what they did on, in terms of the research on this. Um, but what I will mention is that the seed treatment increased the yield um, by by 15% overall. Um, Chris did mention, though, that they have not been able to replicate the um, the same type of results since this trial. However, um, he said he says now on, on at the research station that they do seed treat all of their winter wheat no matter what. Um, they have seen the beneficial of the seed treatment, however. They haven't been able to, like I said, haven't been able to replicate the same results. But what I do want to illustrate is that if 
if you use a seed treatment and you had no germination in the fall time whatsoever, um, there is hope. So just have to give the crop time to recover here in the spring. Moving on to, um, so now we talked the parameters and what to look for in terms of, now we look for in terms of what, how do you conduct a proper spring assessment. So the, the first thing I can tell you is really to be patient and um, step back and really don't look at that field. It'll walk Essentially walk away um, is what I've been telling or telling growers now. Monitor that field um, during spring seeding and um, if you want to, you haven't, if you're not seeing anything emerge, what you can do is there's a couple of in crop or in crop test and then a bag test um, to evaluate what that if the plant derives. So if you were doing an infill test, what what I suggest is dig up dig up plants from several areas, um, low lying areas, top, hilltops, um, just have a rep, good representative sample. Look for new what you want to look for is new root growth. Um, if you can't find any root growth, what you want to do is peel back. Um, the area, and if you can see white, um, white stem, that means the plant still survived, it's just that it needs more time to recover. However, if you are unsure, you can conduct um, a paper test, same, same method, dig up um, plants throughout several areas of the field, rinse off any kind of dirt that there may be, put those plants in a, a moist paper towel, put it uh, put that area or put that paper towel, expose it to light, and you will have, if the plant survives, you will have new root growth within a, a couple of days. Um, and if it did not survive, then your plants will quickly turn to brown. So finally, making that final decision, whether or not you want to make that final decision midway through spring seeding, that will give a time for the plant to recover and as well as gives you, um, there is still enough time for you to make uh, a decision but also have a plan being, plan being in place. Um, ideally, when you're, doing a, when you're doing a crop assessment, we, ideally you want to see 20 to 30 plants per square foot, um, but we have seen through research that plant stand as low as um, 10 plants per square foot can still produce an adequate yield. If you decide to keep a struggling crop, um, early application of nitrogen, I'm not going to touch base on that, Ken will talk about that, um, but you will know that a struggling crop may act more like a, like a spring meat, and I, and I have touched base on this, is that it will be less competitive, so you may have to look at a wild oat herbicide, you may have a delay in terms of maturity, um, but that also will may increase in terms of risk to insects, such as, as wheat midge, and as well as delay your flowering, um, so you may experience um, fusarium head blight issues. And as well as um, you will maybe you may, you may take a yield penalty. So if you decide to terminate a crop, um, I would there's a couple of suggestions. You really want to spray out your winter wheat field, break that disease. Um, especially in southern Alberta, where there is potential for wheat streak mosaic virus to happen, um, not only in southern Alberta, but there has been cases in southern Saskatchewan <clears throat> the last couple of years. So really, you want to break that disease, and as well as um, winter wheat will you start utilizing nutrients and water reserves. So you want to utilize or you know spray out the crop there. Um, again, be mindful of chemical residual and seeding restrictions, so if you do apply any <clears throat> herbicide to that crop in the fall time, um, but also keep in mind, what did you see that winter wheat crop into? What did you see it into canola stubble, um, peas or lentils? Last year was extremely dry in some cases, so there may be, you may have to look at what herbicide was applied in the in crop last year, um, so if the last, because of lack of precipitation, there may be potential for herbicide carryover. So just be mindful of that situation. And as well as remember to 
supply any spring applied nitrogen to the following crop. Overall, if you take nothing away from my presentation, um, is to be patient. Give it, it was a harsh winter and we really want to look at, you want to evaluate the crop midway through spring seeding and give it time to recover. Lastly, in summary, um, regions with good fall moisture, I, survivability should, I don't feel should be an issue. Um, but what I do want to touch base on is the fact that we have a lot of snow, especially in now, and because of our cooler climate or conditions, and snow's not really melting all that fast. Um, I do want to be mindful of snow molds. I didn't touch base on it. I didn't touch on it. Um, if you have any questions on snow mold, you can you can contact any of us. Um, but just be aware that this disease can linger if that snow is going to be persistent and linger on. Um, how I kind of gauge snow mold is I look at my front yard and if I have still have snow and all of a sudden it's receding and I can see my grass, uh, mold in my grass, then that's a good indication that I'm going to have uh, snow mold issues in, in uh, winter wheat. So regions that, ex that had dry fall conditions, um, Unfortunately, survivability is uncertain. This is really where you're going to have to do an in-depth, in-field, or a paper test to see whether or not that, those, those plants survived. And again, give, time, give plants time to recover. In the dry areas, we will, hopefully we can get a warm, wet spring, and that will be perfect for those areas. And lastly, be patient. So thank you. Thanks, Janine. Um, we actually had one question that maybe, um, oh, it looks like it was answered with your summary slide, but it was just to, to offer a general assessment on the risk of winter kill across the West, but it looks like you did well with that in the summary. So if there are any other questions about uh, what Janine presented on today, you're, uh, you know, please contact her directly or uh, find her on growwinterwheat.ca. Her information is on there and you can follow up with her um, afterward or ask some questions throughout the rest of the presentations. I'll be tracking them and uh, we can answer them as, as we go. So I'm just going to um, switch up our, to our next presenter and that is going to be Ken Gross out of Brandon, Manitoba. He is our winter wheat agronomist here in Manitoba, and he's going to be speaking on fertility management and specifically focusing on nitrogen. So, Ken, when you are ready, you can go ahead. Chris, since I've... Hi, Ken, we can Good hear morning. you now. Okay. Good morning. Um... My name's Ken Gross, work out of the Brandon office, and like Carly says, I've been here for a little while since I did my master's in winter wheat about 30 years ago, which means I'm pretty old. So hopefully I picked up something along the way that um, you can uh, make use of uh, with your producers or on your farm if you're a farmer. Um, when you're talking fertility management, you're mostly talking about nitrogen in the spring on winter wheat. So I'm going to be spending a lot of time on that and answering questions on uh, how much should you put on, when, what form, and talking a little bit about protein because that's that can be an issue with winter wheat. Uh, and you know what, we should be taking more of a balanced approach when we're approaching um, adding uh, macronutrients like sulfur, phosphate, and potash play a pretty important role and there are some emerging issues with those, so I'll, I'll touch on those. Um, nitrogen is the elephant in the room though because it is simply the most important input for high yielding, high quality wheat. And it is your most costly input, so that's why I'm going to spend most of my time on it this morning. Uh, here's an old chart uh, John Hurd from Manitoba Ag put it together. I like it because it's pretty clear. And what he did was measure how much uh, soil residual N there was in different soils. And he found low, medium, high, and very high um, residual N in different soils. And most of the prairies, uh, and especially in the fields I look at, you're looking at low and medium levels at best for residual end, and those apply to the red and the blue lines there. So when you're asking how much, um, you're probably looking at 
um, putting on at least 160 pounds of uh, actual N um, minus your soil residual if you're figuring it out. But you can see a response all the way up to 200 pounds on low uh, residual soils. So that gives you a kind of an information uh, idea of how responsive winter wheat is to applied nitrogen. There are different formulas for figuring out how much N you should put on. Um, South Dakota State University says two and a half pounds per bushel. Um, Mandan says two and a quarter. Uh, some of the recent studies done at U of M show spring wheat responds anywhere from two to three bushels an acre. So I like to use as a basic guideline, two and a quarter bushels um, should be two and a quarter pounds of N per bushel. So if you're looking at uh, 100 bushel uh, as a yield goal, you need 225 pounds of N minus whatever's in your soil. That gives you a pretty good uh, guideline um, to set your yield goal. Of course, there are some issues with this because most of our data, including that slide I showed, is based on the yield potential of our older varieties. And the newer varieties have a lot more potential. I'm, I'm particularly excited about wildfire coming up here. It, it is a very high yielding variety. Um, 78 bushels an acre last year, um, our well, uh, Janine told me on two inches of rain out in Alberta and 130 uh, bushels on irrigation. So it's got a lot of yield potential. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. The other thing is, is that um, a lot of producers still use the same rate of N as they do on their spring wheat. Winter wheat tends to have between a 10 and a 40% um, percent bushel um, or ten, sorry, 10 to 40% higher yield potential than spring wheat. And that's mostly because it makes a very good use of the early spring moisture um, that spring wheat uh, doesn't have access to. It, it starts growing three weeks later and usually the fields dry up a little bit by then. Winter wheat can take uh, advantage of that. Now, we've had some pretty wet years, so um, spring wheat's been doing pretty well, but Overall, we do live in a semi-arid environment. So overall, winter wheat should out yield your spring wheat. So that's how much, uh, when should you apply? Should you apply it at seeding? Um, there's differences in opinions on, on when you should apply in the spring, and I'll touch on that. And then I'll talk a little bit about split apps. And that's something that I'm really promoting to all the producers out there is, is put on a split app. And I'll get to the rationale behind that in a second. It is a little confusing because historically the data showed pretty clearly whether it was done at U of M or U of S that spring applied N provided the biggest yield benefit. Uh, kind of makes sense. If you put some down in the fall, you're likely, there's a long time before it's gonna be actively using that in the spring. So you're gonna lose some, but you know what? As the photo shows that the fall application on the left the crop on the right where, where you saw the spring broadcast doesn't look anywhere near as good. So it, it can be confusing depending on your timing, the formulation, and you know, environment plays a really big role in this. So let's touch on some of these things. And, you know, here's another slide um, from West Co. It's a few years old, but um, it really clearly shows the same relationship that we're still seeing in some of the more recent data is that there really isn't as big a yield difference in, in a lot of years between the fall application, which you see um, there with fall urea, fall urea sideband, versus the spring applications. There really isn't that much difference uh, whether you put it down in the fall or in the spring. And so when should you apply? He, this slide explains why I really, one of the reasons why I promote you know, a split app. And it's a, Brian Barris is a researcher out of Lethbridge. He coordinates all the research across the prairies with Ag Canada and the uh, different universities. And so they've done a lot of studies across the prairies on this. And, and what you see is that the blue bands, there's five different forms of N there at the bottom. And, but with each of them, the blue band uh, correlates to a fall application. The, the red band is a split app and the green brand is the spring application. And so what I, there's a lot of data here, but what there's two things I wanna point out is if you look at every single form, there's really not much of a penalty, if anything, 
by putting a split app down. Um, sometimes there's a benefit. So a split app, um, you're not going to pay a penalty for yield in most in most years. The other thing I'll point out is the UAN sticks out like a sore thumb on this chart. And this is um, why you're going to see some, you could see issues with UAN is because um, the urea form that's in UAN is very um, likely to be lost as ammonia uh, if it's sprayed on. If uh, most of my producers dribble band it, and you can see there's a lot less loss of the liquid form when you dribble band it. So, uh, and this is primarily because you see um, there's, I think it, the number is 40 times more of the microbes on straw um, that provide the urease enzyme that'll convert your urea to ammonia and allow it to blow off. So you want that to come into contact with the soil and then work its way in. Uh, here's another issue that comes up and why I like split app is because we always seem to run into weather issues. If you're out in Alberta, like Janine says, it, it's, it looks pretty wet out there. How are you supposed to put your nitrogen down early uh, in the spring under those conditions? It's pretty tough to get on the field early and I'm going to explain why getting on early is very important. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we run into these conditions in some years where it's too dry and producers don't want to put their fertilizer out under those conditions and for very good reason. And there's another issue here with the element, human element to this. So here's a producer that didn't put any end down in the fall. He knows he's supposed to put it on in the spring early, but the crop looks pretty thin. Uh, a lot of producers see thin stands like this. They want to wait. Let's see what the crop does before they put their N on. And that's the worst decision you can make because that crop needs some health. And, and uh, giving it a little application of uh, uh, nitrogen, a little fertilizer, it gives it a real shot in the arm to, so that it, it can grow out of that. And the, maybe the biggest reason is, is the split app gives you flexibility in dry years. You know there's some N available first thing in the spring. And again, I'll touch on the importance of that in a second. But if you haven't put anything on, if you can put something on in the fall and you have a dry, dry spring, all of a sudden, you know what, maybe you're not going to shoot for a 90 bushel uh, uh, yield potential on that crop. It doesn't have that potential. So maybe it's only got a 70, 60, 70 bushel yield potential. You can dial down your second application and put a little bit less on in these years and save yourself a little bit of money. So when to apply in the spring? This is what everyone should focus on is getting their nitrogen on early, right at green up or right around when the crop is starting to green up. And why is that? Is It's clearly because it makes a huge difference yield-wise. Um, the seed head is produced uh, very early in the spring and winter wheat, and it sets the number of spikes and the spikelets and the size of the head all very, very early in the spring. So if you fertilize early, you have a healthier plant, you're going to grow a healthier, larger seed head with bigger yield potential. If, that, if, you crop, if you wait until later, you're starving that crop, you're going to end up with a smaller seed head. Now, I've seen that happen in the field where I work, walked into a field here um, a couple of years ago. A producer was very happy with the way his crop looked. That's a, a picture of it. Um, he was very excited. It looked great. But when I walked into it, um, the seed heads were quite small. And I knew it wasn't going to yield the way he wanted to. And I asked him a few questions. He put a lot of end down. You can see 250 pounds, but it was a dry spring. He hadn't put anything on in the fall. And he had waited until it was going to rain before he put his end down in the spring. So in the meantime, that crop had already set the yield potential because it, it, it for the seed head. The seed head had already developed and it hadn't developed as big and healthy as it could. So that eliminated uh, a chunk of his potential yield. So timing in the spring, put your N on as soon as possible. It, it increases your tillering if your, your stand is a little compromised after a tougher winter. 
And the studies show that you get a big yield bump out of this. Out of U of S, it's about 30% higher yield if you can put it on right at green rep. If you wait for three weeks, um, your uh, yield uh, penalty can be up to 30%. And in Ontario, it shows an even larger yield penalty. So um, get it on early. You know, the traditional wisdom is as long as you're on with your fertilizer before the four or five leaf stage, you're, you're still good. But your four or five leaf stage can be three weeks later and you've dropped your yield potential. So get it on as early as you can in the spring. So here we go. I always say a split app is the best. And if you didn't put any on in the fall, get it on as soon as you can in the spring. What form should you use? Um, we have newer research than this. The, this is John Hurd's uh, from Manitoba Egg. I like it because it's clean, it's easy to understand, and it shows a number of different formulations and really not much difference in the yield of, uh, of any of them. Uh, didn't, didn't matter what form you used, unless you're on a site with high volatilization risk. So you still have to use the four R's. You still have to think about what your conditions are. Soil. So if your soil um, surface is wet and you don't expe expect any rain for a little while, you better protect your urea if you're gonna put out there. If you have high pH soils, or if you have low organic matter soils, or anything that adds to the risk of volatilization, you should make sure you put on a protected product. So use some common sense. But in summary, when it comes to form, the big risk really usually isn't nitrogen loss, it's your yield loss. So I'm telling guys, worry more about getting it on early than you do than worrying about what form that you're going to use within reason. Because when you put it on in April, the temperatures are still cool. The soil, we usually get a few rains in April. So it's really not a high risk thing like our uh, previous slide showed. Um, and if you can have 50 pounds available to the crop before spring growth, whether that's putting it on early in the spring or first putting it on in the fall prior. Going to touch real quick on protein. Uh, here's a simple chart that uh, you see the um, increasing rates of nitrogen across the bottom and how the blue line is your yield responds, your winter wheat responds very well to higher rates of N. But you can see initially that your protein drops. And I see quite frequently um, producers upset. They had good yields, but they didn't have the protein they wanted. And it's just a sign that you're, you're not putting enough N down there if you're if your protein with these varieties are lower than 11%, chances are you didn't put down enough protein or nitrogen, I should say. So here's what um, farmers can actually do other than just rates. It's timing for a protein bump. And Doug Martin is the uh, president of Winter Cereals Manitoba. He told me I could um, uh, make use of his data and tell people what he does. He split applies his N and he always applies a, a second app, application later on in the year to get a protein bump. Um, he finds that he usually can bump it up to about 12% and that really helps him to market his wheat, which he frequently does down south. Uh, what he does is applies UAN and he likes using the streamer bars because it creates larger droplets. Um, the key for him is to apply it just before a rain to minimize burn. He says he always gets some burn, but he, he tries to apply it just before a rain. So the timing is right around flag leaf. It's nice if the rain comes just before the flag, so you don't burn the flag leaf at all, but it, it's dependent on, on mother nature a little bit. But he's had really good results. He's very happy with, uh, with uh, applying the split N for protein bump. Real quick here, I'm gonna talk about uh, Phosphorus and sulfur, a little bit about potassium. These are some new, there are some new crops out there and we have some newer concerns. Corn, for instance, is a very high sulfur user. So is canola and soybeans are a high phosphate user. So this has implications. Um, this slide just shows uh, how we're becoming more sulfur deficient in our soils because we have these high use crops like, like corn and canola and even peas. 
And uh, sulfur is a macronutrient. It's a building block. Uh, it's going to limit your yields and your protein if you don't have enough sulfur. And if you look at the recommendations right now, a 40 bushel crop requires about 10 pounds of sulfur per acre. Uh, current recommendations are about 15 pounds. But you know what? Our wheat yields are, even with our spring wheats, especially in Manitoba, I'm seeing 60, 70 uh, bushel an acre yields being a norm. And the highest yield I saw was 95 bushels an acre last year on spring wheat. So we're going to be using a lot more. Oh, we're gonna th those big crops are going to be sucking a lot more of the nutrients out of, out of the soil. So how much do we really have in there? We should be providing more nutrients for this to feed these big crops. And it's the same with phosphates. We got these high um, removal crops now with soybeans, canola, of course, and even um, wheat and peas suck a lot of pea out of the ground. And it's important for vigorous seedling develop, seedling development. Um, one of my things I've wondered the last little while is, you know, winter wheat does develop two seedlings, one in the fall, one in the spring. Is it even more important for uh, have proper phosphate available for winter wheat than any other crop? Um, some of the data shows that it, uh, winter wheat does respond very, very well to higher levels of, of phosphate. And uh, you can see the re yield response here from a West Coast study. Um, and we see this in the field where you see, again, P is mostly for seedling vigor. It is, uh, you can see how much more vigorous the, the stand is on the right. That's going to be more competitive. It's going to be more uniform. You're going to have more main tillers. And that's going to translate into uh, the fusarium areas, make it much more easy to time your fusarium application if you have all your heads coming out at the same time versus having all kinds of tillers. The recommendations for pea right now are about 30 pounds an acre. Um, we're seeing some big crops out there again, so they're using more, they need more, maybe we should bump up our recommendations. And finally, what about K? Um, the one thing we forget about potassium is that it's important for straw strength. And you know what? Uh, our varieties in Manitoba in particular, we've gone from very short varieties to some of the taller varieties like Emerson. And now we've got wildfire that I hope works really well here because it's got, it is taller and it's got a lot more yield potential. So you combine a little more height with a lot more yield potential, and you could see some more lodging. So maybe potassium is something you should be looking at. Um, it is an issue mostly in lower organic matter, sandy soils uh, may not be an issue in a lot of areas of Manitoba, but uh, in, if your area, uh, it, it could be an issue. It's certainly something to make sure you have available to the crop. And lastly, I think it's more important than ever to soil test. We can see from some of Rob Graff's data that the yields are increasing dramatically over time here in the last 30 years. And I would suspect I would say on top of that, in the last five years, uh, the, the yields have driven way up here in Manitoba with some of the newer spring wheat varieties producers are using. So I don't think a soil test is an option anymore for top managers, especially this is something to consider if you seeded winter wheat on chem fallow. There's a lot of acres in Saskatchewan that went in on chem fallow. Um, you're going to see a lot of mineral, mineralization on those soils. And your end might be much higher than you think it would be. So, you know, do a soil test. It's pretty cheap and it might save you some money. Um, you might have a lot more in in that soil than you thought. So with that, I think I've used enough time and I'll, I'll end right there. Thanks, Ken. Uh, that was great. Uh, at the end, I'm going to do a little bit of a summary of each presentation. And like I said, if there are any questions, we can answer them. Just type them in the question window and we'll definitely keep track of them and answer them at the end. Uh, but for now, we're actually going to go to our last presentation. Amanda Swanson is a winter wheat agronomist for Saskatchewan, and she's going to talk about all the myth busting that we do around winter wheat. There's a lot of misconceptions about winter wheat out there and uh, she's gonna try to bust some myths for us. So Amanda, I have given you control and you can start whenever you're ready. Thank you, Carly. Um, 
like Carly said, I'm going to wrap up this webinar with you guys this morning with a short little presentation on a fun and somewhat different topic of winter wheat myth busting. So let's get started. Our first myth is that winter wheat is a low input, low yield crop. And we have busted that myth uh, year after year. Winter wheat has yielded an average of 16% higher than all spring wheat varieties for the past five years. And in certain areas, we've seen yields of up to 30% higher than spring wheat. And, um, you know, it could potentially be higher than that too. So winter wheat uh, historically has been seen as a low input crop. But we like to promote the best management practices for winter wheat to get the most of that crop that you possibly can and for it to live up to its yield potential. So we recommend higher seeding rates, targeting 30 to 35 plants per square foot, uh, seed treatment like we saw in Janine's presentation. Uh, seed treatment with winter wheat is very important and can have a big impact. Uh, fertility like Ken talked about, we want to maximize that fertility with your winter wheat crops. You get the yield and the protein out of it. Fall weed control, um, a little bit of 2,4-D in the fall goes a long way with controlling those winter annual weeds that have the same growth habit as your winter wheat crop. Spring weed control um, is field by field dependent. Uh, sometimes that crop is established and competitive. Usually a broadleaf chemical is necessary, not always a, a grassy herbicide, but um, at the time when you're doing your spring assessment, you'll be able to assess if you need a uh, spring weed control and fungicide. We've seen results of um, yield bumps even in dry years with a foliar fungicide applied at flag leaf. So there's a lot of things that go into your winter wheat crop to make it um, profitable for your farm, to make it high yielding. And uh, so we promote these best management practices and we definitely don't see winter wheat as a low input, low yielding crop. It's quite the opposite actually. Myth number two is that there is no market for winter wheat. And when we look at the statistic, actually over 60% of the wheat traded worldwide each year is winter wheat, which is an interesting fact. There are three different marketing options for winter wheat, depending on what variety you're growing, if it's a hard red variety or a general purpose variety. Um, it's the same opportunities as with any spring wheat. So there's a milling market. Canadian Western Red Winter is utilized as a blending flower. It competes directly with CPS in Canada and hard red winter out of the US. We have a feed market and feed mills, hog operations, feedlots all utilize winter wheat. And the profitability of selling into the feed market is dependent on your proximity to these locations. So if you have a local hog barn in the area or a local feed mill, that's something worth looking into, maybe save on trucking, and it could be more profitable to sell into the feed market than even the milling market if you have to haul far away and incorporate those trucking costs. Um, ethanol is another option for winter wheat. Winter wheat, it fits well into ethanol production because of its high starch content. Um, ethanol plants are looking for low protein and high starch. Some of the higher yielding general purpose varieties would fit this bill. And again, if you have an ethanol plant in your area, something local, a niche market, that would be something worth looking into. Another myth we have is that the cold weather will kill the winter wheat that is planted. And like we saw in Janine's presentation, We've got the winter cereal survival model showing soil temperatures, and you can take a look at that throughout the winter if you're concerned. But winter wheat in Western Canada has a success rate of 91%, which means our winter kill rate on any given year is generally about 9%, which is the same as Kansas, the largest winter wheat growing state in the US. So it's really interesting when we get looking at the facts that we are similar to Kansas, and winter kill really isn't as big of an issue as it is perceived. On the left here, we have a picture of some winter wheat in the snow, and on the right, we have a picture of a winter wheat crop uh, midway through the season. It's bounced back from the winter nicely, but you can see in the top left corner, we have a small patch there. And what people may think 
is winter kill was actually ice encasement. This is a field that I worked on with a grower. And this season, um, we had unseasonably warm temperatures in January. We had melting and water running and cooling in this field. So what we had was patches about the size of a vehicle that ended up getting frozen with the freeze-thaw, freeze-thaw cycle of the weird temperatures. And um, this winter wheat was starved of oxygen in these patches and we got ice encasement, which ended up killing the winter wheat. So what might be perceived as winter kill is actually ice encasement. And at the beginning of the season, it's quite noticeable. But as the season progresses and that winter wheat crop starts to tiller out and fill in, those patches get smaller and smaller. So when we see things like this happening, a lot of growers automatically think winter kill, when in reality it could very well be ice encasement, you know, especially if those temperatures get really warm and cause a big melt halfway through the winter. Another myth, there are few choices of winter wheat varieties. Uh, there are actually quite a few winter wheat varieties out there, depending on what growers are looking for. If you're looking for a milling variety or a general purpose variety, um, we've got a list on our website for the different soil zones, but I just compiled a list here. Um, since 2010, we've had 11 new varieties of winter wheat released. There are a couple on here that aren't commercially available yet. Uh, Wildfire, like Ken touched on, is going to be available this fall, and Gold Rush will be available next fall. Uh, they're currently in production with seed growers right now, but those look like really great varieties. Uh, we're excited to see them in full field production. And Rob Graff has been working really hard lately, getting new varieties developed and releasing them so that Western Canadian growers have a lot of choices when it comes to which variety of winter wheat they would like to grow. If anyone has any questions about varieties and what would work best in your area, feel free to contact one of um, the agronomists that are presenting today and we have a lot of insight as to what works in a given area so we're happy to chat about varieties with you. Another myth is that winter wheat yields increase when direct seeded into a field that was previously canola and that myth is actually confirmed. We have some data from Alberta Ag and crop insurance that indicate that uh, there's a 10 to 20 percent yield increase in a winter wheat field uh, that follows canola. And we always promote canola for winter wheat seeding. Uh, it's ideal stubble because of the snow trap potential and it provides the optimum crown tissue protection over the winter. I've got a couple pictures here of winter wheat uh, in the springtime on different stubble types. On the left, we have winter wheat and canola stubble and you can see that it's nicely sheltered in those rows by that canola stubble. And on the right, we have winter wheat on lentil stubble. And you'll notice that there's virtually no stubble there on that field. With any pulse uh, crop, peas, lentils, there isn't much for stubble or snow trap potential on that field. And we're not saying that if you seed on canola stubble, you will have better yield than a different stubble type. We have had growers experiment before with lentil stubble and pea stubble, and they have been successful. But it all depends on your winter, your snowfall, moisture conditions in the spring and fall. There's a lot of things that go into it. So experienced growers that know what they're getting into will play around with these kinds of things. But we always recommend for first time growers, new growers that you seed on canola stubble, and give that winter wheat a really good start. The world record for wheat yield goes to winter wheat, and this is confirmed. So the world record yield is 249.68 bushels an acre, so almost a 250 bushel yielding winter wheat crop. Now, obviously that was not in Canada, that was in New Zealand. So conditions in New Zealand are a lot different than the conditions in Canada. I've got a photo here of a lovely field of ptarmigan in southern Saskatchewan and this field yielded about 100 bushels. So 100 bushel winter wheat yield in Canada is great. 
Um, there is a potential to do that in any of uh, these areas that we're working in. Again, completely mother nature dependent, but it's just neat to know that winter wheat holds the title for the world record highest yielding wheat crop. Now, this is a myth that we didn't have a, a neat little infographic for, but I stuck it in at the end of my presentation just because I think it's important, um, especially given the conditions in southern Saskatchewan this past year and it's happened before. The myth that I hear a lot on Coffee Row and with growers is that if your winter wheat does not come up in the fall, it will not set seed or make a crop the following year. So that myth is busted. Um, this is completely false. We want to put growers' minds at ease. If it doesn't come up in the fall, the winter wheat will still come up in the spring. It will still make it to maturity and you will still have a crop. There's nothing to worry about there. Um, Janine showed us some pictures of that IHARF study with seeding rate and seed treatment and that crop did not come up in the fall. And in chatting with Chris Holzapfel, he actually said that was one of the highest yielding winter wheat crops they've ever had. So not to set that precedent, but just so guys are aware, it is still possible to get a great winter wheat crop, even if it doesn't come up in the fall. I have some pictures here of, uh, this is a field that I'm working with a producer on this year. It was seeded on canola stubble. Unfortunately, last fall, it was very dry in Southern Saskatchewan and very few winter wheat crops actually came out of the ground. So it didn't matter if you seeded on August 25th or September 15th or September 25th, all the winter wheat crops sat in dry ground because we just didn't have any moisture. So when I dug around for the little seedlings, they had just sprouted, they hadn't cracked the surface. Um, like we saw on Janine's table with winter survival, this does cause them to be less hardy over the winter. It's not a write-off and it's, it's not ideal. It's just something to be aware of and that this crop will act more like a spring wheat crop when it comes to delayed maturity and competitiveness with weeds and, you know, potential of reduced yield. So I just wanted to throw this in for guys that are in dry areas that didn't have a crop come up that might be concerned about the outcome. It's you know, it's it's not ideal, but it's not the end of the world either. So with that, uh, those are our uh, winter wheat myths that we wanted to bust for you guys today. And um, if you have any questions about anything in this presentation, or you want to talk about varieties or conditions with any of our agronomists, feel free to reach out to us after the presentation, and we'll be happy to chat with you about that. So I'm going to hand it back to Carly. Thanks so much, Amanda. I'm actually going to unmute uh, Janine and Ken as well. I'm just going to take back the controls just so we have that ready. And everyone should see my screen in a minute here. Uh, so Amanda, Janine, and Ken, you are all unmuted. Uh, I do have a few questions, so I just wanted to... Um, get to that first, and then we can, uh, if you have any last comments, we can definitely discuss those. So, Ken, the first one is for you. You mentioned the importance of P and K for winter wheat. What are the critical P and K soil test levels as to when P and K are needed? Well, that's a good question because they usually test P in um, parts per million. And so the soil samples that I've seen, they usually give a little bar chart or whatever and, and let you know how much what that correlates to as far as a low um, residue crop or a, a soil I should say but generally like I, I put in there is that you, you want to put you want to have um, 40 um, pounds of pea available I would say 40 to 50 in that range for your winter wheat and uh, the only soils that I've ever seen have that levels have been um, ones that have been manured. As far as, I think K was the second question, most of our soils in Manitoba are very high in K, so we don't have to worry about it. I'm not so familiar with the other areas, um, but um, generally I, I suggest having 15 pounds available, whether that's within the soil or within um, within a addition. And um, those generally, if you're on a, a low 
um, organic um, material soil, a sandy soil, you, you might be a little bit low in K. Thanks, Ken. Janine, the next question is for you. How can I access the online winter kill program um, that you showed during your presentation? Um, the, so the winter survivability model is if you just actually it's quite easy if you want to just go to Google and type in winter cereal survival survival model um, it should be the first thing that pops up um, and just click on that uh, website um, I don't it is also called uh, wheatworkers.ca um, just for your reference there Thanks, Janine. Ken, this is a follow-up to the previous question. Which soil test P method, Olson or modified Kelowna method? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, that's more for a soil scientist. I've got a little information on that, but not. Uh, I think a lot of the labs, it depends on which lab that you go to, which test they use. And um, I don't know if I should say, does anybody else have a, a better answer than that, Janine or Amanda? Sorry, I'm not sure if there's much of a difference in, in, in the quality parameters with it. Nope, that's great. Thanks, Ken. Uh, there are no other questions. So, you know what, I'm just going to wrap up here. And if you have any other questions, want to follow up with any of our presenters today, uh, they are, are all winter wheat agronomists, happy to help you. If you are a grower and, and you need some help, uh, you know, on your farm, or if you are an agronomist and and want to help your, your customers better um, and need some winter wheat knowledge, uh, the three presenters today would definitely be willing to help you out. So again, please visit growwinterwheat.ca uh, and under agronomist, you'll find all the contacts there. Uh, or, you know, shoot us a note on Twitter at growwinterwheat and we definitely help you out that way. Um, just to wrap up, I'm just going to summarize the presentations and the key points that I, I took from everything. Um, with Janine's opening presentation, you know what, seed treatments make a big difference especially when you're not dealing with, with ideal conditions. Uh, be patient is the main key message there. And not to do a set, an assessment of your crop until halfway through the spring seeding. So you know what, That's, that, those were the key messages that we're dealing with this spring. So best to keep that in mind. With Ken, you know what, nitrogen is the most important management tool you can use w with winter wheat. Uh, he encourages a split application as the best option. But, and when it, applying in the spring, make sure you get it on early and right at the green up time to get your maximum yield potential. Remember the four R's of nutrient management stewardship. And don't forget about the other um, nutrients with sulfur, phosphate, and potassium, uh, and stressing the importance of a soil test. And that's something we do advocate, uh, as well as four R's um, is a soil test to ensure you're doing the right things. Uh, Amanda's fun little presentation at the end, you know, the best way to bust any of those myths everyone hears out there is proper management of your crop, making sure we do that. Uh, winter kill is not always an issue, you know, especially with the graphic she showed about Canada's, uh, you know, prairie winter kill is 9%, the same as Kansas. Uh, you know, at, winter wheat can be marketed, you just need to be creative, and winter wheat really does love canola, uh, and that's where you can get a, a yield boost there. And zero fall emergence doesn't mean a disaster. So, you know what, these are some things that when you are managing your crop properly, you shouldn't have any issues. Obviously, we know Mother Nature sometimes has a different view on that, but uh, that's kind of what we're dealing with uh, this spring. So with that, I'm going to close. The Western Winter Wheat Initiative is a partnership between Bayer Ducks Unlimited Canada and Richardson International Limited. Again, you can visit us at growwinterwheat.ca or find us on Twitter at Grow Winter Wheat. Uh, you can reach us anyway. This w webinar was recorded and it will be available on our YouTube channel um, later on. So thank you again for everyone who joined us and I, I hope you have a great rest of your day. Carly, before we end, I just wanna thank, um, just give thanks or acknowledgement to the slides provided by Indian Head, um, the pictures and the data, as well as the funding partners for that project. It was BA, BASF, Bayer and Dr. Brian Bears. Perfect. Thank you so much, Janine, for doing that. Uh, Ken or Amanda, is there any uh, last thoughts you want to mention before we hang up? Great. All right. Again, thank you everyone for joining us and uh, good luck this spring.